Welcome back to One Hit Wonderland, where we take a look at bands and artists known for only one song. And you know, folks, one thing that I really lament is that we are losing the lame 70s from our cultural memory banks. Love, love will keep us together. And let's be clear, the 70s were overwhelmingly lame. Now, I love 70s music. Arguably, it's my favorite decade, because the good stuff's so good. But the 70s was not just Bowie and Queen, funk and disco. A lot of disco was actually really bad too, people forget that. But before the disco 70s, you had the glory days of AM radio gold. And most of it was horrendously cheesy. Even the really good stuff is kind of cheesy. Here, here's a, a music book I've had since I was a kid. The, the songs of the 70s. And you know, let's see what uh, classics we got in here. The, the very best of the 70s you'd want to sell to people decades later. Skyrockets in flight. See, the thing about mediocre music is it goes away. Feeling. Gets kicked to the curb. Sometimes people like remembering it for nostalgia reasons, but if you weren't there for this, you'll think the older generations had no taste at all. And with the decline of oldies radio, there's no way you'd catch most of this stuff in the wild, unless it shows up in one of the Guardians of the Galaxy mixtapes. Well, I do consider the point of this show to be at least partly historical preservation. So for the grand return of One Hit Wonderland, I am taking us back to the storied, Famous worst year in pop music history, 1974. We had joy. It's weird for a single year of music to have such an infamously bad reputation, but it's pretty earned. I think the entire concept of bad music was invented to describe 1974. What made it so bad? Well, let's examine one of its biggest hits. In the heat of a summer night, in the land of the dollar bill. This is the band Paper Lace from Nottingham, England. Yes, the one next to Sherwood Forest, that Nottingham. They had a singing drummer and some pretty awesome perms, and a name as chintzy as their music. Paper lace is, you know, these things. You get them for three bucks at Joanne Fabrics because you can't afford real lace. And also you're a 90-year-old woman who's never heard of coasters. A disposable name for a disposable band. But these lamos topped the charts with one of the most gangsta hits of all time. Well, no it wasn't, but it was literally about gangsters. When a man named Al Capone Try to make that town his own. It's an insanely violent song about the biggest, baddest gangster in American history, Al Capone, and how he murdered the band Chicago. No, it's not. Though 74 would have been a good year to kill that band because that was the last year they were good. And the sound of the battle rang. But the actual song is about Capone's historic reign of terror in the city of Chicago, and yes, there is a lot of murder in this song. I heard my mom and yet it's upbeat and jaunty. My mother is weeping, hundreds dead, brother you should have been there, woo! Glory be. It's a colossally stupid song, and it is not fondly remembered, judging from this compilation CD I found it on, but it topped the charts and then they disappeared forever. What happened to them? How does this song make any sense at all? Well, I guess we're gonna find out. Paper Lace, the episode none of you were clamoring for, tonight. The night Chicago died. Na, 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 na. And here's the funny thing about Paper Lace, they are arguably not one-hit wonders, because they actually had two number one hits in 1974. Just one in the US and one in the UK. And the song that went to number one in the UK also went to number one in the US, just for a different band. I'll explain. I like it, I like it. Actually, before we get to the lame 70s, why don't we start in the lame 60s? See, there was a songwriter named Mitch Murray. He literally wrote the book on songwriting. He had a few hits with a bunch of Liverpool bands who weren't the Beatles and did not turn out as big as them, for obvious reasons. In 1968, he found a new partner in lyricist Jeffrey Callender, and their collaborations produced some, I guess I call them odd songs. Maybe it just sounds odd to me because they have characters and stories in them, which is a thing that does not really happen anymore. Like, here's our first big hit, The Ballad of Bonnie and Clyde. Bonnie and Clyde were pretty looking people, but I can tell you people, they were the devil's children. Cruella de Vil, Cruella de Vil. Kind of a corny sounding song about legendary murderers, and not the last one they'd write either, but we'll get to it. In the meantime, they wrote a bunch of British hits, 
all of which sound like rock and roll was never even invented. Uh, none of them really made it to America. Oh, except that one. I've heard that one. I like that one. But they got big enough to start their own label, Bus Stop Records, and for their first signed act, they grabbed the band Paper Lace because they saw them on TV. Opportunity Knock! Yeah, these guys were the winners of Opportunity Knocks, which I guess that was the Britain's Got Talent of its day. I can't tell if TV is better or worse now. The Paper Lace had waited so long to get on the show that by the time they made it, they already had a record deal. But their first album hadn't gone anywhere, so they took Bus Stop Records' offer, and within months, they had a number one record. And that record was Billy Don't Be a Hero. Billy Don't Be a Hero is a weirdly peppy little tune about tragic star-crossed lovers. And in this case, the tragedy is war. Billy gets drafted, his girl tells him not to be a hero, as in, you know, come home alive. And there's only one way this story's gonna end. And Billy's hand was up in a moment, forgetting all the words she said. Billy, like an idiot, decides he will be a hero, and then he comes home in a box. It immediately went to number one in the UK, but before they had a chance to release it in America, some other band beat them to it with a quick cover version. Billy, don't be a hero, don't be a fool with your life. And that stolen version immediately went to number one in the US. It's a real dick move. And Paper Lay should probably have released their version in America first, because it's an extremely American tune. The soldier blues are trapped on a hillside. You know, Billy's wearing soldier blues, so this is probably the Civil War they're talking about, you know, with all the drums and fifes. I have no idea why it caught on so well with the British public. You know, maybe it resonated with their memories of World War II, but it's really obvious why it caught on in America. Like, I don't know if you know, but in 1974 there was a war going on. If you've ever watched a Vietnam War movie, you know what Vietnam sounded like. Sound like Fortunate Son or All Along the Watchtower. But the weird thing is, even like the dorky, easy listening hits were also about war. One tin soldier rides away. This is really weird to think about today when we've been at war for almost 20 years and no one even cares anymore. But throughout the entire Vietnam era, there were tons of hit songs about the war. Or at least a war, or about war in general, or by the band war or even not remotely about war, and yet had the war projected onto it because that's all people could think about. Leaving on a jet plane suddenly becomes about leaving to war. Tie a yellow ribbon, which is about coming home from prison, becomes about coming home from war. Really don't be a hero. This is not a Vietnam song either, and it would sound badly out of place in an actual war movie. But I don't know if it could exist if the public wasn't just feeling so beat down by this war because it has a really dark ending. I heard his fiance got a letter that told how Billy died that day. Not just because Dead Meat Billy gets himself killed, I'm talking about this line. The letter said that he was a hero. She should be proud he died that way. I heard she threw the letter away. Well, yeah. What's she supposed to do with his death note is frame it on the wall? But symbolically, you get it. She tosses the letter and presumably tosses his memory and just moves the hell on with her life, which she still has, unlike stupid Billy, who means nothing, who cares. It's a really cynical ending for such a goofy, lightweight song. But that is not Paper Laces hit in America. That would have to wait until their follow-up. Here we go. I'm going to be honest, I did not originally intend to do an episode about the night Chicago died. I, um, I got my facts confused. I thought I was doing Billy Don't Be a Hero. I thought that was their one hit, and it's a guilty pleasure of mine, and I wanted to cover it because of all the Vietnam subtext. Instead, we're taking a trip to a very different time in American history. Not a war, but something nearly as violent, the reign of Al Capone. And you know what? Maybe there's some subtext of the times in this, too. Like Billy Don't Be a Hero, it's about a loved one not coming home. And as Tom Bryhan of Stereo Gum points out, Nixon had just resigned, so maybe there's some connection there. 
The Prohibition era of organized crime was a crazy, chaotic period, just like Watergate. Al Capone was a figure of extreme political corruption, just like Nixon. Okay, it's a reach. Like, this was the number one hit the week before. I feel like making love to you. That's probably not about Watergate. But the night Chicago died is still very much an artifact of its time. In the heat of a summer night. It's a story song like we still had in the 70s. It's a song from when even the most worthless bubblegum acts still bothered to resemble actual rock bands with their own instruments. Also, it's extremely 1974 in that it's extremely bad. When the town of Chicago died. I can't really tell you why this one is so much worse to me. Because it's pretty similar to Billy Don't Be a Hero. Same chords and everything. All I know is few songs irritate me like this one. Astonishingly, it's not the worst song of 1974. My baby. Like, I'm not sure Paper Lace would even make the bottom five. That's how bad that year was. But I still couldn't tell you why people would want to listen to them. Okay, it doesn't start out so bad. We've got some drums. Siren. Some backstory. Daddy was a cop on the east side of Chicago. Back in the USA. Back in the USA? Did he leave? In the heat of a summer night. In the land of the dollar bill. It is jarring to hear foreigners talk about America the way we talk about other countries. Like, if I landed in Japan and it was like, Wow, Japan! The land of Speed Racer and the Chopstick. Like, that's this song's approach to America. Like, you can tell it knows nothing about America because it has one of the most infamous factual errors in pop history. Daddy was a cop on the east side of Chicago. Yeah, in case you don't know this one already, there is no east side of Chicago. There's a north side, a south side, and a middle part they call the west side. No east side, that's just Lake Michigan. So unless his dad was on boat patrol, this line is impossible. Through the streets of the old east side. The writers admitted they just got Chicago confused with New York. It's a thoroughly unconvincing attempt by Brits to sound American. It's the song equivalent of Benedict Cumberbatch's flat American accent. And then Al Capone murders the entire city. Okay, probably not literally. But he does lay down a siege of violence on the poor, beleaguered Chicago PD. And he called his gang to war with the forces of the law. It's a cops versus robbers shootout, I guess. And I asked someone who said, about a hundred cops a day. Heard my mom cry. A hundred cops. One zero zero dead cops. Okay. To be clear, nothing like this ever happened. Because in general, it's bad to attract attention from the police to your illegal activities by murdering them. Capone's actual weapon against cops was bribes. Murray and Calendar were just writing based off of vague impressions they got from old gangster movies. Compared to your modern drug lords, Capone is almost quaint. He's linked to 33 murders, none of them cops. That's not really that many. If you want to call anything the night Chicago died, the city's history has many, many, many more tragic events to choose from. So I listen to this song and I can only ask, what the hell is Capone even doing? And the sound of the battle rang. Like, what is his goal? This is not gang violence, this is a military coup. Generalissimo Capone is trying to conquer Chicago and declare himself dictator for life. Like, Christ, maybe this was a war song after all. I should have played this in Full Metal Jacket. I heard my mom cry. Anyway, the singer's dad is a cop. Mom's crying because dad's probably dead. Brother, what a night it really was. I've had to listen to this song so many times with just writing this episode, and I can't begin to tell you what tone they're going for. Is this a fun song about his mother crying? It's so stupid and annoying. Like for some reason, pop acts in the 70s enunciated way too much. I heard my mama cry. Last of the hoodlum gang had surrendered up or died. I mean, I guess it's supposed to be happy because you know, everything comes out okay. Then the door burst open wide and my daddy stepped inside. Cops win the fight, evil lies vanquished and the dad comes home unscathed. And, uh, and then there are kazoos. Oh. Oh, yeah. Is this supposed to be like a, th a throwback to the Capone era? 
you know, this is what 20s music sounds like. I didn't like this retro music hall stuff when McCartney did it, and these guys are not Paul McCartney. You know, I'm gonna get up and do the Charleston. It's a dance song. Why is this song so stupidly happy? What a sight. Everyone's bleeding and dead. Like, you listen to this song, it sounds like people are just standing around watching this gun battle with stray bullets flying everywhere. And they're just taking pictures with their phone, shouting, World Star. In fact, it kind of sounds like another one-hit wonder smash from 1974, inspired by violent movies. Everybody was Kung Fu fighting. Yeah, but that one's fun and innocent, because Kung Fu movies are fun and innocent. It's not mobsters making the streets run red with blood. It kind of sounds like we're dancing, because there's a hundred pigs lying dead on the sidewalk. Dracula! I mean, I don't think it's that kind of song, but it kind of sounds like it. Kiss my mama's face, and it bust her tears away. Like yeah, this was a number one hit. And maybe after the craziness of that era, you know, all the riots and war and Nixon, people wanted a story where all the violence was silly and upbeat, and the good guys win, and everything ends happily ever after, and you just laugh it off. Like, you know, wow, that was crazy, right? And Paper Lace do admit, you know, they also frame themselves as the victims. They milk their sob story about having their first hit stolen. Just like Lil Nas X was able to ride his story about being screwed by Billboard. Yeah, Lil Nas X might want to read these guys as a cautionary tale, actually. Because it turns out a sympathetic story and one catchy song only gets you so far. Paper Lace has one of the least impressive post-hit careers I've ever covered on this show. Oh, the Black Eyed Boys! In the UK, Night Chicago Died went to number three, so Paper Lace is known as a two-hit wonder over there. They had a third song that also nearly hit the top 10. It must have immediately plummeted because no one remembers it. And it's about a motorcycle gang. It's part of the trend of these lumpen British glitter rock acts trying to bring back the 50s. Some of them are pretty good. Some are this. They are trying to sound more like an actual band. Like their first two hits are bubblegum, but it's not like they could be teen idols. They're, they weren't particularly stylish or good looking. So them trying to be more of a glam rock band could have worked, but at this point I think they were pretty pigeonholed as not a real band. So yeah, this is not Ballroom Blitz as much as it is Sha Na Na. And they tried remaining a pop act too. That also didn't work. Okay, hold on. The original version of this song had come out five years earlier. That's too short a time to release a cover. Did these nothing bands just trade songs back and forth in the 70s? I don't know. And since none of their other songs off that album got big, I guess Paper Lace decided they could do better. They broke their contract and switched labels, and then they got sued. I can't find out much about the lawsuit because no one cares about this band, but I'm gonna guess it didn't go well for them because they followed up their giant hit-making year by never releasing an album ever again. The end. No. Well, okay, yeah, one thing. So the local Nottingham soccer team is Nottingham Forest. Yes, they're all very merry men, I'm sure. And they had a big championship year in 1978. You know how in this country we have, like, Super Bowl shuffle in the 80s? Well, the Brits put out one of those, like, every couple years. And surprise, they're almost all terrible. Well, anyway, apparently Nottingham Forest wanted to cut their own big championship song and since the only other musical act that city ever popped out is Alan Adale, they decided to dig Paper Lace back out of obscurity to help them record a brand new, amazing championship anthem. We got the whole world in our hands, we got the whole wide world in our hands, we got the whole world in our hands. And not exactly we are the champions, is it? Did you really need a band's help putting this together? It's just a version of a kid's song. Also, this is kind of blasphemous. And that's it for them. They never put out a follow-up album, they kept losing members, and they ended for good in the early 80s. And I'm gonna guess they didn't stay on good terms either, because they eventually reformed into two separate bands, Paper Lace and Original 70s Paper Lace. Great. <laughs> Mostly what I got from doing this episode is how not to have a lasting career. Establish no identity with your first singles. Tie yourself to really kitschy music almost designed to age badly. Sever ties with the hit makers who you owe your success to. I don't think they deserve better. I don't even think they really wanted better. They seemed like men with very limited ambitions. They liked having hits, but they wanted to be, you know, Three Dog Night, not The Beatles. 
they are the very definition of a disposable act. And to be clear, sometimes disposable acts can make truly great lasting moments, but this is not it. There's a reason why no one listens to this song anymore. Like, I've seen people defend The Night Chicago Died, but I'd give it like a 2 out of 10 at most. Just an obnoxious song in all ways. The received baby boomer wisdom always said that the 70s were worse than the 60s for music, and I finally get it. It's not that the good music was less good, it's that your average music got so much worse. Like it wasn't Motown anymore, it wasn't garage rock, it was shit like this. The night good music died. Ugh.